A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other one as well. If anyone wants to go to law with you over your tunic, hand over your cloak as well. Should anyone press you into service for one mile, go for two miles. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not turn your back on the one who wants to borrow. And you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly Father. For he makes his sun rise on the bad and the good, and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brothers only, what is unusual about that? Do not the pagans do the same. So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good luck with that. Be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Why would Jesus say that to us? It just seems so unrealistic to have that kind of expectation. But at the same time, is it something toward which we should all strive? To love the way Jesus calls us to love, as difficult as it is. I mean, I think of all the scriptures and the, and the demands that Jesus makes of us. I mean, we have listened to the last week, the Beatitudes, and the week before that, we are listening to Matthew's rendition of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus just seems to keep going on, and he keeps using that line, you have heard that it was said, as he talks about the old law, but now I say to you something a little different. And he does this a number of times, and every one of them is a challenge to us. Today is no exception, and probably even more of a challenge. I mean, in just that first part of the gospel about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, Jesus talks about personal insult when someone tries to take away our dignity, so to speak. Violent personal insult, even. You know, and then he uses that phrase, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other one as well. I don't know if you're aware, but in the time of Jesus, there were a lot of people who had slaves. And the tradition was a, sl a master had a right to strike his or her slave. But they would traditionally strike them with their right hand, and they would backhand them. That was a sign that you were lower than I am when you backhand somebody. Does that make sense where you could line with that? So you had a right to do that to a slave. Well, Jesus said, when someone strikes you like that, making you lower than, your, than they are, then he says, turn the other cheek. Then they have to slap you the way equals would slap each other. You hit the right hand, you hit somebody on the left cheek. That's the way equals spar against each other. So Jesus, he, he's got it together. He knows how things are working at that point. Even when he moves on to the point where he says, uh, pressing someone into service for one mile? Are you aware that the Roman soldiers, by law, had the right to demand of any person to carry their cloak or their backpack one mile? Only one mile, though, and if that soldier made that person carry their backpack or their cloak more than one mile, the soldier could get in trouble. And that would really be demeaning for that soldier. So, I mean, Jesus, when he's talking about this, he knows what's going on in the community, and he knows how difficult some things are and what we have to watch for in our own life. But I need to go back to the line that we hear today, offer no resistance to the one who is evil. How do we deal with violence? 
insults in our life? How do we deal with attacks from the outside? How, how do we respond? We know that pacifism was how Jesus lived. Now, was there ever a moment where Jesus wasn't so passive? Do we remember, do, do you recall a moment in the scriptures where Jesus got kind of violent? When? Temple. Yeah, when he was at the back of the temple and they were selling all kinds of things and he got angry, didn't he? So he made a cord of whips and he was turning over the tables and whew. You know what, I'm really glad Jesus did that at least once in his life. Because it makes me feel okay when I get kind of like that. I have my moment too on occasion. To know that Jesus had that moment. But the rest of his life was truly one of being a pacifist. The way he allowed himself to be tortured. To offer that sacrifice of his own body. And to die without fighting. Do you know that in the first 300 years. Until the 4th descent into, into the 4th century. Christians practiced total pacifism. It was the way. Because Jesus lived that way. It was the practice of the time that you would be passive. We know, we listen to, I mean, Mahatma Gandhi, the story of his own life. I mean, here's a guy who was an attorney, a lawyer, knew the law, knew what was just and unjust, wanted justice for his own people. Now, even one time he got onto a train, a white train people's train and they told him to get off he says no he said it's all right for me to be here because i am like you you are like me we are brothers and sisters we should be able to ride on the same train together they beat him and they threw him off the train because he was not one of them did he retaliate with violence Martin Luther King, demanding of his own people and all his followers and all people in the world to protest, but do so non, with nonviolence. Difficult to do. But then I would ask those of us here, from what kind of background do we come ourselves? Are we a people that come out of violence? You know, I think back to my own days as a kid, and my dad would be kind of rough with us kids once in a while. You know, when he had a good day and things were going fine for dad, and he, got, he was gonna discipline us boys, he would sit down and talk to us. But I knew the days when he wasn't having a good day. And that day it was easier to just haul off and swat us, okay? That was quicker and easier sometimes. And I thought, ah, oh, we'll never be like that. And then I became a teacher. <laughs> and I will never forget my first job teaching in Winona. Father Nelson had hired me to teach at Cotter. And he told me before class, classes started at the teacher workshops, before school started, and I, I wasn't a priest, and he just, I remember him saying, now Joe, this class went through three teachers last year. They all quit. And they're all seniors this year, and they're gonna be tougher than ever. So you stay on top of things in that classroom. First few days of class went fine that first week, but I got down to the end of that week and it was like Friday. And I'll never forget this because this one student, a big kid, gets up, walks across the back of the classroom, right in the middle of class, and he goes over and starts talking to his friend. Right in the middle of class, he's talking out loud, he's not even whispering. I said, you know, sit down, what are you doing? I said, I'm just visiting with my friend. We're making plans for the weekend. I said, well, not in the middle of class, you're not. Go sit down so we can continue class. He says, make me. And then he says, what makes you think you're going to stay here any longer than last year's teachers stayed here? You ever have people do things, just pull a cord in you? Just set you off? So I walked back to him and I said, you're going to go over there and sit down right now. And he says, like I told you, make me. I went into my dad's mode. <laughs> And I remember I did this thing where you grab, you ever have somebody grab you back here right behind the elbow? I took a good grip on him. And I'd been working out with the wrestling team at St. Mary's University. And I had 
pretty confident in myself at that point. I grabbed him by the back of the elbow and I started to lead him. I said, come with me. I was going to take him out the door. I grabbed him really hard. I squeezed very hard and almost kind of just pushed him toward the door. He pulled loose. He took a swing at me. And I just as quickly just responded. I slammed him against the wall. I got his arm behind his back. He's fighting, struggling, and I'm holding him there. And finally, I just, this is in front of the whole class. And I said to him, I said, I'm going to back up, let go of you. And I said, you're going to follow me out the door. I just whispered that to him as much as I could. And I just let him go and I backed away and I walked out of the room. And I stood out there waiting for him and he wasn't coming. <laughs> now I thought, so what do you do now? And as I started to reach to the door to open it, here he comes. And I, and I said to him, I said, this needs only happen one time this year. I said, are we at a good place with each other right now? Because I said, I, I'm not even going to send you down to the principal. I want you, I said, I'm going to get you a note. You go down to study hall for the rest of the class. I said, we'll see you on Monday. And I said, we'll pretend this never happened. And he shook his head. Um, Monday, he was not in school. And one of the students came up to me after class. I was calling things and he said, Father, did you hear about so-and-so. I said, no. He said, well, he got in a big fight. He went over to the public school and got in a fight with a kid over there and beat him up pretty bad this weekend. Now, first of all, just to tell you what I felt. First of all, uh, it was one a sort of a sickness inside of me that I was sure that probably because of the violence I did to him in front of his classmates, he needed to make things right again. And so if he could pound somebody else into the ground, it might make things okay. So he could go on living. And I, I have to tell you, I still feel a guilt today yet when I think about that. And I thought about my dad, and I thought about, I think about other people in, in our world who just choose to use violence as a means of settling things and making things right as we think. But does it ever, does violence to another ever make things right? Yes, we say sometimes in self-defense we may need to do something like that. But even then, Gandhi would never have defended himself. Jesus would never have defended himself that way. Nor would Martin Luther King. And look at the changes those three made in our world. Today, for us, Jesus offers a very difficult challenge. Yes, offer no resistance to the one who was evil. But it's only in struggling and trying to do that that we can come close to perfection. You know, for that student, for what happened that day in that classroom, I never had a problem with the boys the rest of the year. I had a little problem with some of the girls because I couldn't do that kind of thing to them. <laughs> but you know what? That was not the right thing to do. And I still don't know what would have been the better thing to do. And so it is in our own lives. We struggle to do what is right, to do what is loving, to love particularly the enemy. And it's for us as a church, even listening to our popes from the past, and particularly John Paul II and Benedict and Francis now, all taking the same stance on violence and any kind of war, recommending we not enter into war. Taking another life is not going to change the course of the world. But do we see that? And do we understand it? And do we know what Jesus is trying to tell us as he teaches us to be perfect?